Good afternoon, everyone. I would like to just finish up the chapter of Leninger with three technical stories that include new things that have happened or people have found out recently. So there's three stories, one about cellulose, one about the glycans, and one about click chemistry, the way that organic chemistry can make uh, Nobel Prizes happen in this particular area with a scientist I've been talking about for years and I've been predicting she would get a Nobel Prize. Finally, I was right. So let's start off talking about cellulose. I mentioned that there was bulletproof wood and so I'll tell you how they made it. So the one thing to realize is cellulose, uh, carbo, uh, carbohydrates and oligosaccharides and things like that, there's a lot of evolution that goes around that because there's a lot of structural diversity that is easy to make from these. It's just hard for us to tell because there's so many structural options. It's hard for us to get a pure sample and to get its single structure that we can understand. It doesn't mean that there's not meaning out there. One way that meaning comes about is that the human gut can actually evolve to digest different linkages. For example, here are these different oligosaccharide linkages and you can see how they do it. They're mostly mannose in this case. And there's are different branches that are um, that are on uh, yeast in the one case, and then I think those are three species of yeast. But that's a biological question, so don't quote me too much on that. And I just want to make sure that my microphone's working because I didn't check that until now. Okay, we are good. But the thing about this is that then you have the mammalian, which has a lot a mammalian oligosaccharide, which has a lot of mannose in it. And so there's actually a way that gut bacteria have evolved to be able to break these high mannose structures apart. Now you need to have a specific enzyme to be able to recognize the mannin and to be able to cut apart these weird linkages. Notice that you have weird linkages, not just one to fours all over the place, but you, you, you in fact don't have a beta one, one uh, an alpha one to four, you have a beta one to four and you have all these other ones. Different structures require different enzymes. And so the one thing that we've seen is that we've seen that actually we've seen evolution in real time in the sense that gut microbes evolve to be able to digest these yeast oligosaccharides when you eat more yeast. And we've actually gotten that down to the exact mannosidase, okay? This is a mannosidase that, is, that cuts the alpha 1-6 linkage all terribly complex but i want to show you at the end beginning of this is an oligosaccharide at the end of this is an evolved enzyme and if we can see how this works we can digest these mannose linkages so that means that even for the toughest of uh, polysaccharides for cellulose itself which is probably like the most the man of steel in the sense of the superman of polysaccharides even this has its kryptonite Okay, you need to have specific enzymes and they need to have specific conditions. But there are enzymes that will recognize and break down the beta 1 to 4 glucose linkages that are in uh, cellulose. Now, the thing about cellulose is it's not always completely lined up. Sometimes you have crystalline regions that are completely lined up and have super tight bonds. Then you have amorphous link regions that are less uh, tightly bound. So those are easier to break apart. You have some enzymes like the blue enzyme in the middle that goes after those linkages. You even have some enzymes that will go after the linkages um, in the crystalline regions. And you also have in green, you have a glucosidase, which goes after the disaccharides. So once these are chopped up into disaccharides, you have another enzyme and it's pretty easy to break down the disaccharide. What's hard is to get to the crystalline regions. And so those take special enzymes. Now the thing is, how do they make cellulose stronger so that it's all crystalline region? And it's actually pretty easy. Well, all you have to do is you have to remove the holes somehow. One way to remove the holes is that you treat it with base at first to break down some of the bonds between it and to make it just a little more fibrous. And then you put it under pressure. And just by doing this, you will line up those hydrogen bonds. Remember, this comes from the fundamental structure of cellulose itself, and you're just making it more crystalline. This is called densified wood. You can reduce its thickness by 80%, and it ends up with a 10 times increase in strength and toughness. Look at this chart over here, which is a chart of strength. Natural wood is around 100 on this chart. Densified wood is around 500. And this was super easy to do. You just do base and pressure, 
but it was a recent nature paper or science paper, one of the two, um, that talked about doing this because it is so useful. Now this can be combined with other um, materials like the chitin in the squid beak was combined. And if you combine a super a strong wood in a certain layer with a siloxane polymer, you actually make a wood-like material that will deflect bullets. Here's the deflected bullet down there, and this is strong enough to be able to fend off bullets. I'm not sure if this is densified, but this has been, uh, this is something that can be compressed by the bullet in more ways. Um, and so that's my thing. It's pretty surprisingly easy to take wood and chemically toughen it up because you're building on the fundamental structure of the thing. Here's another thing that just came out. You can have water shock that will actually shrink the wood. This is without pressure. And if you do it in the right way, you get something that is moldable. You actually have it swollen in a certain way that you can actually bend it. And then you can, um, this bent wood can be done in a honeycomb shape like they have over here. And it's strong enough, it's super strong, so you see its density is pretty low on the graph up here, but its stiffness is really high, and that's how much pressure in gigapascals that it can take. It can take up to 28 gigapascals, which is like hugely strong, because you've molded it into a reinforced honeycomb kind of shape. So if you look at this, you can drive a car onto it. This is molded wood, it's very light, and yet it will hold a whole car driven onto it. Um, that's pretty strong if you, you think about it. And maybe this could be a good building material, insulation material, I'm not sure. But of course, you don't have the enzymes to break down cellulose like, the, uh, like we showed on the, the first slide. And so this is getting back to being the linkages that you, you can't do. And think about it, the alpha linkages are easier to break than the beta 1 to 4 linkages. There's fewer bonds around them, and they don't adopt a crystalline conformation. You don't have as many bonds. So we have enzymes that are amylases that will break apart alpha linkages, but we don't have enzymes for beta linkages. It's just too hard for us. And we don't need to. Why would you do something? You, can't, you don't evolve stuff you don't need. You need it in some way if you've evolved it. So we can get food other ways. But termites, on the other hand, they've evolved a way to do it. What they have to do is they have to have a special uh, chemical characteristics to their gut. And they have cellulases that will hydrolyze this linkage. And that's why termites can actually digest wood. Technically, it's the bacteria in their gut digesting it. So again, this difficult chemistry is given to bacteria to do. They can do chemistry better than we can. Just like termites have this in their gut, cows actually actually have an extra stomach with their own cellulase secreting bacteria that allows them to eat grass. Then we can take these extracts and we can replicate the anoxic sub stomach environment and we can use that for paper recycling. And so this also, also works out several ways. And so the, the one last thing I wanna say about cellulose is that it's in coffee beans. And so the coffee bean itself is mostly cellulose. When you roast it, there's actually a stage where the air and moisture inside it boils and expands, and it literally pops like popcorn. I did not know this about coffee. It doesn't pop completely open like popcorn, but it just pops a little bit open. And that's why coffee looks like this. The popping sounds are important because they tell when the coffee has reached a certain temperature and pressure inside and that lets you know how much it's been roasted. So coffee roasters will actually listen for this. And the reason why there's a crack is because the cellulose is very strong, but it can't hold up against the steam that's produced at a certain temperature. That steam produces a quick phase change that suddenly just like the cellulose gives way and you hear the crack from that. There's actually two cracks. The first one sounds like corn popping, and the second one sounds a little different, but the, it's the same idea. Cellulose, pressure applied, it gives way and cracks, like wood cracks. So that's the, the stories about cellulose. There's also a story about the glycans that I want to tell you. There's ways in which they can be antiviral. So remember that there's a lot of um, heparan in different places, and there's some heparan sulfate on membrane-bound proteoglycans. That means it's on the cell surface. 
and viruses can actually um, can associate with with uh, the cell surface if we had something that would actually block the viruses from being able to get through the proteoglycan layer we would actually have a um, binding uh, a binding uh, event we would be able to block it by making the same thing that they're binding to but having it free in solution rather than bound to a cell they bind the thing they float away into solution because it's not bound to a cell that's the idea it's actually like affinity chromatography if you think about it but i won't spend too much time on that so look at the compositions of these these are um uh glucosamine glucosamine with an acetyl group on it then there's a couple of other things you don't have to know about but those make up the heparan sulfate uh, polymer and you look at this and you have they have little red dots for the uh, negatively charged groups that are on it and so you have a certain pattern and not everything gets every dot and so they had different densities of dot different densities of charge and they wanted to see how this would work in the real life situation i want to show you not their results but i want to show you what they built so the red dots were all sulfate groups if you look over here r equals so3 and so that's exactly like what we showed you and so they as chemists what they did is they constructed these particular oligosaccharides with these particular groups in these particular cases. That's a lot of organic chemistry going on. And how exactly do you do that? It's actually a very difficult problem. And so this has been an area of organic chemistry, but if you do it right, you can make something that will inhibit a virus associating with the cell. You have an antiviral agent, and it's modeled based on the natural glucosaminoglycan. It looks like heparin or chondroitin in some cases. So I just want you to see these sugar structures, they're all the blue in this, is stuff that you have to memorize. That's why you have to memorize it, because it's important and it will show up in papers like this. So here's an example of them showing how they actually made one of these mimetics, and it actually blocks SARS-CoV-2 binding to cells. It actually works against this most, um, this biggest focus of attention that we have right now with how do we make antivirals. If it works for this one, by the way, it probably would work for other ones as well. And there's an interesting thing. You might have noticed how I said that people thought that sulfation was random. And in some cases it is, but in some cases it's not. There's actually a signal being sent through the patterns of sulfation. So chondroitin, if you remember, it's not as negatively charged as heparan. It looks like heparan in the sense of it's a polysaccharide that has sulfate groups on it. But the sulfate groups are distributed in different ways throughout the molecule. When scientists first do that, they say the easy answer, well, it's difficult for us to look at this, right? So it must not be important. Linda C. Wilson, back in 2006, said, what if it's important? She developed a chemical way to make particular sulfation patterns. And that's all she did. And then she tested it and she found out, for example, particular patterns will bind growth factors. They will affect neuronal growth. I don't know about you, that seems pretty important. So certain patterns that she made in the lab, and it starts with the organic chemistry of being able to piece together particular organic chemicals. Then you test your hypothesis that this signal, this arrangement of sulfate groups is important and not this other one. And that tells you that there's meaning and purpose behind these things. This is That was back in 2006. Her work is still continuing. She is sort of a, a giant of the field, and I do wonder if she'll win a Nobel Prize someday, um, because you see that there's all these other groups that have followed her lead in making different kinds of glycans with different patterns of negatively charged groups on them, and they see that those do different things. This is all organic chemistry, but it's put to use in a biological context to do biological things. And that brings us to our final story. This is actually pretty quick because we've been leading up to this. I've been talking about how organic chemistry is important to carb chemistry, right? Well, it turns out that I've been talking about Carolyn Bertozzi for years, and I've been predicting she's going to get a Nobel Prize. And finally this year, just a week or two ago, it was announced that she finally got one. And it honestly hasn't been that long, but I've just been impressed with her work for that long that I've been predicting it. So it's good to finally be right. 
This is one of the articles that happened before her Nobel Prize 2020 about how she is a glycoscience evangelist, okay? And she talks about developing the chemical techniques to make certain carbohydrates, certain oligosaccharides. Once you do that, you can test them for biological effect. And it's actually a fascinating organic chemistry question. How do you make this part of this molecule react when it looks so much like all these other ones? And the one way that she did it, so this is about the whole Nobel Prize that's actually awarded to three people, but in my opinion, Bertozzi is the important one. The concept of click chemistry uh, is what she works on. She developed a very specific way to have an azide on the glycan, to have a cycloalkane that will react with that azide and only with that azide. And so you can put a fluorescent label on a particular glycan and uh, you can click it on. Copper is um, one of the things that she worked with to make a, um, so copper was originally used for this chemistry, like one of the other guys developed a copper way to do click chemistry. She developed a non-copper way to do it. And uh, so you notice there's no copper in here and it's really important, really useful, and allows us to do a lot of cool organic chemistry that has a lot of biological implications to it. I just want to say that you can find a lot of pictures of what she looks like now, but this is what she looked like when she was starting out, not that long ago. But um, this is a picture of her at Berkeley at one of her early stages in her career. And I just want to point out what she's drawing on the board. There she is. Uh, decades later, she will get her Nobel Prize for continuing to work on this stuff. So memorize your sugars. You never know where it might lead. It could even lead to a Nobel Prize or you can at least understand Nobel Prize winning work. And that is the lecture. So now you are ready for test three. Please um, go ahead and get caught up with all that stuff and we will meet on Friday to review.